Bite came about from a discussion that Anika and I started to have about uh, where our work intersects, um, education and fairness and civil rights. And then um, Nick was introduced to the discussion, and we're so grateful that he was, because um, he brought hope. And so, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, just a little background is that uh, before joining Data and Society, I was consulting for UNICEF on, an, on a global mm. scoping exercise for how children use technology um, globally and, and child safety issues. And one thing that became very evident is that poverty is a critical indicator of how vulnerable children are. And so this became a main focus for us, was vulnerability and poverty. And when I started working back here in the US on issues of education, um, a main indicator of how well children will perform and how well undergraduates at college will perform, the key indicator is always the education level of the mother. No matter what the intervention is, it always comes back to the educational level of the mother. So when you start with this, when you start thinking about poverty, and do you mind, do we have the slide on? Of course. Um, I want to show you one quick slide. And the reason I want to show you this slide is because we don't talk about poverty when we talk about low performance in, in education. We, we do talk about race, but we rarely talk about poverty. We don't talk about a disproportionate number of, um, of prison inmates come from low, low socioeconomic backgrounds. So today we're going to talk about that. And what I have up here is not a graph that you need to see the numbers on. I just want to show that um, of this is from the UNICEF report card. And what it looks at is relative poverty. What that is is the percentage of families who are living 50% below the median income. In the US, the median income as of 2013 was $52,000. Yeah, $52,000. I'm sorry, I, I almost said pounds, and that would have been. Uh, <laughs> And <laughs> what I want to show here is the U.S. is is at the very lowest of the list of, of the top um, of, of, of the economically advanced <coughs> countries, and um, it's only above Romania. Uh, for those of you familiar with the European Union, Romania is, is one of the most poorest countries in, in the European Union. In fact, Roma children are often stereotyped um, you might have heard of them as gypsies, but they're often stereotyped um, in much the same way that um, African Americans are stereotyped here. So, so I wanted to just start with, with the poverty discussion. And so in thinking about poverty and thinking about low socioeconomic status, I was talking to Anika saying, where do we go? If this is where we're starting, how do we ever get kids out of poverty? Because it isn't a school, schools are not pipelines to prison. It's a cradle to prison pipeline. And so how do we move past this? Yeah, so just thank you for having me and thank you for um, coming here to hear what little I have to add to the conversation about systemic injustice um, and, and inequity and what, um, I guess, what role tech plays in trying to solve that problem. Um, I think you're totally right about you know, tech being um, thought of as either a panacea or as you know, a weapon of some sort of, uh, um, that you know, will either It'll either like level society or just completely like destroy society or something like that. Um, and yeah, just coming at it you know, with a, a bit more um, of an intentional approach that pro, um, puts the populations that we do want to serve first. Um, I think that is the ultimate goal, really. Um, so just, I mean, it sounds like pretty much everybody here probably knows the stats better than I do. Um, but. We thought it might be helpful just to start off with the basic information so that we're all on the same page. Um, super basics. New York City has, um, boy, my eyes are bad, 8.4 million. <laughs> um, and a, you know, we have about 1.1 million um, students in New York City's um, public schools. And that was um, right. And so each year, we have about a quarter million students that miss school um, more than 20 consecutive days. Um, and that really is just kind of where you start seeing um, the effects that have built up since childhood. Um, around fifth and sixth grade is really when you see young people really start to fall behind their peers, because you have the aggregate effects of you know, not having, um, I think, uh, Monica, you talked a lot about how um, mother's education level is the biggest predictor of, um, or is a great proxy for predicting someone's um, ability to succeed later in life. Um, yeah, and about fifth and sixth grade is really when you start seeing that effect. 
Um, and then I just threw in another happy number over there. Um, 7,600 number um, young people were arrested. So New York State is one of those um, unique states in the country where we prosecute 16 um, and 17 year olds as adults rather than as, um, as young people. Um, so when that kind of coincides with the fact that um, we also do arrest young people in schools, um, you know, you can't really, you can't help but step back and say, look at all the things that we're doing um, as a society, um, imposing these kinds of rules on ourselves to set, you know, um, other members of society behind from, from the get-go. Um, you mentioned an interesting uh, stat that, that the reason it happens around fifth and sixth grade can also be because of immigrant families, right? Having right. the oldest child watch the younger children? That is, that is one of the things that we found, um, especially around um, areas like Jamaica and certain parts of Queens, um, where you have um, large immigrant populations. A lot of the young people um, actually end up living two lives in different, um, two different continents. They travel back and forth from you know, um, the place where their parents grew up. And because of that, they're not able to commit to um, school here. Um, or school there, and you know you start falling behind because you know, I, I think we, I mean we see it all the time, but like you know it's kind of hard to imagine exactly what the lifestyle of an immigrant pop, um, family is like um, in New York because you know we 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 tend to see so many people in passing, um, yeah. and I don't know I don't know how many people here actually. Um, um, meet and hang out with young people, <laughs> you know, like that all the time. So, yeah, it's, it's a fact that, you know, I think we as a, um, as a city tend to kind of miss because, you know, they're just not there to talk about their problems. Um, they're also not, you know, there to talk about their problems in English, which is really um, the point of access for a lot of us. OK, um, enough about that. So I really like the way that you're talking about it as like a cradle to prison pipeline. Um, and for a lot of people, um, you know, it, doesn't end at prison. You know, you go out of prison, and then maybe you're out for a couple months, and then you find yourself quickly back into prison. So, I mean, you know, it's really like cradle to death, and a lot of that is spent in prison. Um, but, you know, basically in New York City, um, in New York City, um, the, the reality of this, um, the school to prison pipeline is that it's really easy for you to get in trouble at school, and especially if you um, happen to be of a certain color. Um, Especially if, I, and um, I don't want to jump ahead um, too much, but yeah, basically it's you know, I think does, did anybody have like pink slips back in the day? Is that something that's a complete um, right? So <laughs> I don't know. I used, I didn't get in trouble that much because I was too lame to do that. But um, when I did, I got a pink slip. I think for the same kind of offenses here. And if I happened to be you know black or Hispanic, I would just as easily be um, get like a. Pre um, a superintendent's um, suspension or go to an offsite suspension, maybe in a borough that I've never been to before. I think um, one of the examples that I talk a lot um, about when I try to describe this phenomenon is um, in some of our alternative to detention sites, um, I worked in Staten Island for a while, and we had s young people who were maybe 14, 15, um, involved in family court or you know, in criminal court in Staten Island, and they'd be sent to um, another school in, in Brooklyn for six months out of the year. And you can imagine, um, I don't know how many people have been to Staten Island, but getting from Staten Island to Brooklyn when you don't have a car, it takes about two hours to do that, um, especially if you've never been in another borough before. That can be a pretty harrowing journey. Um, and really, that's really when you see, start to see young people start to fall off from school because it just becomes an untenable solution. Because not only do they have to go to school, they also have to do all, um, they probably have an IEP, an, indiv um, an individualized education um, plan. I think I said that right. Um, and you know, there's also family issues. Maybe they're taking care of kids. You know, mom's working. Um, they have little siblings. And the cost of transportation. And the cost of transportation, which in Staten Island happens to be um, a big issue. Um, you get arrested often for, you know, hopping um, onto a bus without a metro card. In fact, the vast majority of young people that are arrested in Staten Island are arrested for theft of services. Um, yeah. So, of course. 
or why, why are they in schools that are so far away? Is there like this is a point where you evaluate which option is automatic? Um, the exact mechanics, I, I'm not, it's maybe some, some of our friends in, um, that work for the DOE can um, explain it a little bit better. I, from an abstract perspective, it's more of a, the way that I understand it is a logistical issue. I think a lot of that is a Staten Island problem, that Staten Island particularly doesn't have resources for alternate anything or right. special ed or anything, but I think it's also just that there are limited amounts of alternate sites. So even within a borough, a student can be going very far away for an alternate learning center and there's disruption in their education, their coursework, their credit accrual. So the, the geographic borough part, I think, is specific to Staten Island, but the same problems can exist if you're going across a borough. In other right, boroughs. from Brooklyn to, to the Bronx, for example, is also a common pattern. Um, and I think that just kind of gets to the next point, um, or I guess to our ultimate point where we're trying to go with this, is really um, issues like this tend to kind of propagate a larger set of issues. It's not just about you know, digital literacy, or um, it's about legal literacy. It's about knowing your city and how you can access the resources in your city to make your life easier. And often these are the populations that also have the least resources because Frankly, they're just often invisible to um, most of us. Yeah. I'm wondering if, before you go any further, if you could just tell us what motivated you to do this work. Sure. Um, that's a great question. And, you know, <laughs> I was trying to practice this earlier. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't get easier. Um, <laughs> actually, come at this kind of from um, a weird angle. I, I actually have um, a creative writing and arts background, um, and I was teaching in um, public schools um, in Providence, where they have a similar issue of information access. Um, there's a huge immigration population there that, um, you know, they just don't have the resources to teach. Um, creative writing or writing or reading really to um, the huge immigrant population that they have in, um, in, in Rhode Island. So that really got me started thinking about edu um, questions of education policy, education access, poverty, and so that's why I decided to study um, policy. And at the Center for Court Innovation where um, I was lucky enough to be able to try my hand at doing a lot of different things. I um, was really trying to move towards bringing together my passion for um, installation art, you know, thinking about crafting large scale um, kind of environments for people to where you can kind of have a say in how people um, experience something. I don't know, the question I was thinking about is like, for example, can you make people feel disappointed in your art? Oh, that's interesting. You know, and I think that's kind of like the same thing about um, policy. <laughs> it's <laughs> not, can people make feel, um, can people feel, um, you know, that it sometimes go, yeah, it goes without saying sometimes, but um, it's, you know, like, can we, how sensitive can we be to the people that we're trying to craft these things for and really be so sensitive to that that we can really just, um, you know, treat them as individuals rather than as, you know, um, a system-wide population. Yeah. Okay, let's race through this. I, I think everybody's familiar with this. This is just really just, um, depressing information. <laughs> um, and obviously the lifelong um, repercussions of having even been arrested one time um, is horrendous. You lose um, the city for, I mean, this is something that really doesn't get talked, up, talked about that often, but like, I think the city loses upwards of about $5,000 per person um, in terms of just like tax revenue that we miss out on. Um, so I mean, you know, that's really what I care about. <laughs> and that, that doesn't even account, account for the costs of, of the correctional system. Right. And we were talking about this earlier about how um, New York State's largest employer is, you know, the corrections um, system. Right. Um, you want to talk about the million dollar projects? Sure. Yeah. I can't remember the year now, but or it's been quite a dollar. while ago. Okay. Um, um, the, the Metropolitan Museum of Art hosted a, a digital, well, let's see, what was it? It was an information, visual, information visualization um, exhibit. And one of the, one of the topics was um, this million dollar blocks project. And so they took a block in Brooklyn and showed the, the costs of incarceration 
for um, people who had grown up on that block or who lived on that block. And when I looked at this, I immediately thought, I wish they could overlay that with what it would have cost for an education, for a college education, for even an Ivy League education, just, just to get the differences, because this is, this is annual costs per person. And so I think that that would be very interesting. And it's kind of hard to see, but um, you know, I think the lowest number on there is like $45,000. Um, that's per person. That's definitely way less than what we spend on um, all the related social services, correctional costs, and stuff like that. Um, Repeat offenders, recidivism. Recidivism, um, yeah. And, and well, I think could it also be the cost, the, the legal costs, if they're if they're having trials, um, different types of, if they're having solitary confinement, if they're having different types of services like psychological services or medical services. Are you saying those are the costs per year? I believe so. Yes, right. per year. Um, somebody can Google that really quickly. Laura Kern. It's what? Laura Kern. Um, so this is also an image from that same pro um, uh, million dollar blocks project. Um, just wanted to, just, we were going through the data and just noticed, you know, it's really easy to see when you map it out like this, just where the different problems and how um, are in the city and to what extent they affect people disproportionately and unequally across the city. So this is, I, th I think this is East New York or Brownsville. Um, and this is the area that the million dollar um, blocks focused on. And then next is some um, absence data from the DOE um, taken from a, a report that um, the New School wrote back in 2008. And you see the same area right here where more than about one in three young people from East New York and Brownsville missed more than 20 day, consecutive days of school a year. Um, if a, a school year has 100 days, they're missing basically a fifth of the school year. And that's just during the school year. Like, we don't know, for example, what they do during after school or during the summers, which is really where the divide starts to open up. OK. So maybe we can start, a little, start talking a little bit about um, where tech comes into play. Um, I think we are make, feeling um, a mix of optimism and pessimism about it. <laughs> we can start us off. Um, y yeah, so one of the things that we're interested in figuring out, again, is how technology can come in and hopefully hope, uh, so helpfully help us out figuring out these solutions to these problems. Um, one thing that Nick was just saying is showing that these maps actually show a lot of things. When we're seeing, we're seeing where people are not going to school, we're seeing where people are being in prison, we're seeing that these things are all interconnected and figuring out a way to use technology to solve a variety of problems that are coming from the exact same neighborhoods, the exact same locations. They're, they're all connected in some sort of a way. Um, and that's what Nick has been working on and can tell us a little bit about. Yeah, um, OK. <laughs> so I, I think really the big question is, and um, I guess I should just start off with how excited in working with young people at the Center for Court Innovation, whenever we go and talk to policymakers at the city, um, or even teachers or principals at different schools, the, or even, for example, like the, um, I'll use Kevin O'Connor since we just talked about him. Um, he's an assistant commissioner at, at the NYPD, and he's the one who's spearheading um, all the different data collection efforts that, where they um, literally have a department at the NYPD that just looks through um, social media, Facebooks, to see if they can try to anticipate where crime's gonna happen and what crews are most likely of getting it, um, most likely to commit a crime, right? So they literally sit there and go through YouTube videos and transcribe lyrics to see if there are hints of you know, future actions, like you know, future violence. Um, so his, People like him, when you know, they talk to us about what young people um, you know, care about and what young people can do to really um, make change in the communities 
and um, you know the subcultures that they that they work in. You know, they think, okay, great, these young people are going to really open the doors up to us and allow us to access a subpopulation that we've never been able to actually reach before because they know the right hashtags, they know the right subcommunities that care about these different things, and it's simply a matter of connecting the dots, right? I, I can't help but think that that's a little bit naive to think that you know because we have access to these communities that we can actually go in and reach and um, affect some sort of change and reach out to them. Um, it's not that simple, right? I mean, you have to go in there. I, um, and you know, for those of us here who like do client-related work with um, you know doing programming or code, coding or whatever, you know, half the job is going in there and doing the research before and doing the follow-up training and documentation to make sure that the, that the people that you're trying to reach actually continu continue to use it, are able to troubleshoot the issues, and are able to um, you know, start t talking to other people about it in a way where people get what exactly it's supposed to be. And you know, just because we all have smartphones and just because we all have access to the internet doesn't really necessarily mean that just because we make an app that is really helpful that people are going to use it. I think the, really the perfect example is um, uh, this app and also um, this app. Both are really great apps, um, but just you know, there's not that um, the usage numbers don't really reflect or map um, match the kind of expectations that everybody had within the city when these things kind of came out. Could you explain a little bit more about this app that we're looking at? Sure. Um, so this is an app that um, this is a web app that the Youth Justice Board made um, in collaboration with the Center for Urban Pedagogy, um, and it's a really a great app that aims to make it easy for disconnected youth to access the services that they need um, to, in order to, for them to um, either get re-engage school or access the services that they need to re-engage school or get a job. Right, so when we talk about disconnected youth, we're talking about youth that are um, you know, over 18 and still in high school. Maybe they have you know, 16 credits left. Um, they're many years from graduating. Um, so they're probably not even going to school because they've just given up on the idea. And because they have given up on school or they're not going to school, they're also not, they're also the kids that are least likely to get a job. And because this population isn't necessarily a population that you're going to meet walking down the street, they also tend to be the most invisible. Um, so we made this app to try to help out this population. Um, and it's totally based on um, zip code data. So we try to make an exhaustive list of all the different social resources um, for young people. Um, there are eight categories. Um, the first category is high school or um, task. So it, if you click on that, it takes you to a page where you read tips on how to, um, basically it tries to like reduce the friction between you getting off your couch, for example, and getting to the nearest um, uh, referral center, um, DOE referral center, where they can probably look at your transcript, look at how many credits you're missing, um, and then try to funnel you to like the nearest school where you can catch up on your credits. Um, this is also a, the nearest place that will help you um, access job training, um, English classes for um, you know maybe you're a first generation immigrant, um, you don't have you don't know where the nearest ESL class is because you don't have internet. Um, housing and foster care, another mi minority population that is extremely vulnerable because they're also the young people that are most likely to not have a place to live or have a very unstable housing situation. Um, Health care and counseling um, among young, young people who, especially among um, black and Hispanic communities, there's such stigma against mental health issues that they usually go und undiagnosed. Um, and then you suffer the effects in school because your school doesn't understand that you need an IEP or that you need special attention. Or maybe you just need glasses. You know? um, and then there's LGBTQ support. Um, also another population along with the foster care community. They kind of coincide. Um, the community that's also one of the most likely to get arrested um, and then charged with um, you know, sex offense because um, 
survival sex is a thing, you know, where they're trading sex, sexual favors in exchange for food, um, protection, maybe a place to live, um, and then more. Yeah. What, what this app development highlighted for, for us when we were talking is, is that um, there's a lack of knowing where to get resources, right? right? And, and isn't that a, a, a critical factor for um, impoverished youth is that they don't have necessarily the social support or the social net to know um, where to find help because possibly their parents don't know either they're immigrant communities or um, unemployed or you know just a host of factors, drug, drug addicted parents. Um, and so, so was that the, the motivation for creating this app or was there some sort of need identified? Um, so this came out of, um, the program works in a two year cycle. The first year is dedicated to research. So we go out and we um, hold focus groups with kids that are um, affected by the issue. And a lot of kids, um, talked about how not only did they not know what the first step would be so that um, for them to re-engage with school or to access the service, it's just, yeah, they were like, even if you go on the internet and you try to Google, um, like, get back into school, those, a lot of these programs, for example, and services, they're not search engine optimized. Like, I'm not going to be able to find um, uh, a task program in Flatbush if I go if I you know dropped out of high school um, and you know in Flatbush and I don't know where the nearest internet center is or um, I don't even know what the task is you know like up until a year ago I thought it was called the GED for example. So this is really interesting because this this overlaps with both of our work that that there's an assumption that because the information's out there because there's an abundance of information there's also an abundance of resources and help that that anything you need can be resolved by the internet right and it sounds like you very much found that 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 wasn't true in speaking with youth and working with you right and I I think this goes back to kind of what um, Kevin O'Connor was talking about we just need a way for. Um, you know, they're primarily interested in a way of like curating the information that's out there so that they can access it, um, so that they can find out, you know, who's getting in trouble or not. But it's also the same thing for um, these young people. It's who's going to curate this information for them. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, Um, it sounds like the adult intermediaries in these people's lives need to be aware of these resources. I mean, like I said, I'm a public librarian, and I'm sure that in the in the schools, even though a lot of these kids don't spend a lot of time in schools, you know, maybe it's more that the community anchors need to, you know, push these resources. I mean, you know, we get uh, asked all the time about task. Um, you know, preparation and all this stuff, and so, you know, and I'd never heard of these apps, so I, so doing outreach, like not being surprised that the kids themselves aren't downloading the apps, but making sure that the adult intermediaries do. We're doing... We're not doing Q&A yet, but uh, can, can we just finish? But what I'd like to do is we're going to wrap up talking, and then in 10 minutes we're going to have questions. So do you want to talk about? Um, Could you yeah. talk specifically about what the program offered and, and, how, and the benefits you saw from it? And then we'll, we'll oh, right. Yeah. Um, so another program, are you talking about um, the, uh, the participatory action research? OK. Um, what do you want me to say about it? <laughs> well, I meant, OK, so the Center for Court Innovation right. offers um, Youth, youth courts. These are all things oh, that, that none of us have really sure. heard about. And, and also they offer um, a, a housing database to, to keep their parents from, from being homeless and those sort of things. And right. I think that these are, these are programs that, um, that significantly reduce recidivism over two years, and they're not things that are normally talked about. I mean, I, I, I didn't hear about them until we talked, and I think that they really offer hope, and, and I'm not sure how scalable they are, but maybe you could describe what they do and then what you think about scalability. Sure. Um. So the Center for Corner Innovation, if you're not familiar with it, we have um, multiple projects, lo project locations across the city. Um, Staten Island, I mentioned, is another one. Um, Red, Ho uh, Red Hook Community Justice Center, if you've, ever been, um, gotten, if you've ever gotten in trouble for a quality of life crime in South Brooklyn, that's probably where you're going to do your community service. Um, there's also the Brownsville Community Justice Center. There's a lot of different locations around the um, city that offer experimental programs. Um, so you were talking about Youth Court. Um, youth Court is one of the, um, Youth Court is another program where 
young people are invited to participate as you know, the judge, jury, public defender, and the community advocate. So we have, it's kind of like mock court, but the repercussions are real, and the young people are the ones that decide the sanctions. And so when young people feel like they're, part, they're participating in the conversation about what happens to them, and they understand that you know, there's transparency here, like their peers are the ones that are um, determining what, how many hours of community service they have to do, what sort of like prog um, programmatic mandates that they're responsible for. When you have that sort of transparency and you have that sort of fairness, young people, um, it doesn't really matter if it's young people, adults, humans are just more likely to respond well and actually follow through with all of those mandates willingly because they understand why they're doing it and they understand how they're implicated in this thing. I mean, I guess it's like the same thing, right? You have a toddler, you know, you can't just tell them they can't do it. They're gonna ask you why. And that impulse doesn't really stop ever. And you found in the research, actually, that, that they compared um, people with traditional sentences versus people with the same, I'm sorry, same sentences in traditional courts or they've received it in youth court. And um, over two years, there, there was a, a significant drop in recidivism for those who had gone to youth court. And when they interviewed them, they said that they felt that the sentence was fair. So, so there seemed to be a difference in when they were able to have their, their peers review the, the causes or the, I'm sorry, I'm not a lawyer, but when they, had, when they had their peers review the cases versus when they had a traditional court. Right. Situation. So this is another issue that we brought up a lot, is that a lot of the interventions that we're coming up with for youth are being created by adults for youth without having the youth voice in there. And that's why we were saying that this, this particular intervention, intervention happens to be so helpful because it, there's a piece of belonging within the own community um, in helping themselves come out of whatever situation there may be. So my question for you is essentially how can we continue to do such, especially in the technological community, mm -hmm. um, how can that be translated and continue to happen? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we like to um, ask the easy questions. Yeah. <laughs> I, you know, it's actually really funny. Um, in working with young people, the most interesting thing that I've learned is that these young people are often also the hardest on themselves. Um, having sat in on you know, uh, court proceedings and in youth court proceedings, the young people are many times more likely to over-sentence um, than the judge. And it's actually kind of ridiculous because you know, you're in there, you're in youth court for having gotten into a fight and where you were the one that was beaten up, but because you also were arrested for fighting and you know, we all know that fighting's bad, um, you might get Sent, you might get sentenced to, I think I saw something like 24 hours of community service, a letter of apology, and all of these different things that are completely disproportionate to the actual quality of the offense. Um, whereas like a judge will just say two hours of community service and you're out. And I, th I think that just kind of talks to, I have a point with this, um, is that you know, young people are super motivated, especially the ones that live this reality every day. Um, it's just a question of, how do you present them to, um, with these options? And for some people, it's like, how do you access them in the first place? Um, but how do you get them to actually feel like that their opinions really matter and that their work is really being reflected in the product and output that you're um, achieving? And I mean, I don't have an answer for that. I have, I, there are certain ways where, um, you know, that I like to do that, where young people feel more um, empowered to be able to be a part of this population. And it's really about skills teaching and project-based learning and all of these different things that sound nice but are really, really, really difficult to actually put into practice. Um, right, I mean, I think participatory democracy is kind of like the holy grail for everybody that really cares about civic engagement. But um, that's the big question is like, how do you, for example, like if young people want to create an app that um, where they're able to rate um, how friendly their local um, police officers are, right? Thinking about those concepts is really easy and young people have, these young people have like tons of ideas about what ways they can solve these problems, but like 
it's who's willing to go in there and teach you know database management and like writing a controller to kids that you know are maybe like 15, 16, and are at the fifth grade level for math. Um, so, so the title of our talk is Can Tech Disrupt the School to Prison Pipeline? And I was just wondering, are there examples that you're seeing of promising technology that can disrupt? Because I think we've been talking a little bit about different ones, like different possibilities. Right. Um, I definitely don't think that um, like tablets or additional infrastructure in schools may not I don't think that's necessarily the answer. I think that's you know probably part of an answer. I mean it's a great I mean it's great like nobody's going to complain if I get if a kid um, in you know in East if a classroom of kids in East New York gets a tablet but it's who's going to be um, you know is there what what sort of follow up is there? And I think that's really the big question. Do you think some of these apps might might help decrease the likelihood of because you also talked about interventions where um, where they they received sentencing for nonviolent crimes, smaller crimes at younger ages, to deter uh, future actions, and they were getting services right away or earlier. earlier right. Um, yeah. So that is. I think that's really where it gets tricky, right? Because um, what. What Monica's talking about is um, there's a new pilot program in New York City um, as part um, in Harlem and in Brownsville. If you're 16 and 17 and you get arrested for certain low quality of life crimes as part of the broken windows policing strategy, um, they're working with the Center for Court Innovation to offer um, services to those young people. Um, and you know, basically, the arrest kind of disappears. But you still have to get arrested, and you still have to go through um, social services. So it's kind of a trade-off, right? I mean, it's if you, I mean, if you get arrested because you're walking down a street with a bunch of your friends and you're, you know, um, causing a public nuisance, and you have to do five hours of community service and social services about like anger management because you reacted poorly to the cop, like that's not a productive use of time, and. I think really the opportunity there is, um, you know, how do we teach young people like what their options are? Like, you know, it might not be the case that they have like a great lawyer that is able to teach them what these, um, what their options are, or um, you know, like how do you get back into school after missing school for so long, or you know, how do you catch up on all your missing credits? It's like, like you were saying, like it's an um, it's a question of access, and I, I think this app is really what we, where we try to go um, go at it, um, try to answer that problem. We talk to people from, you know, advocates for children. We talk to people from the DOE and stuff like that. So, yeah. I don't know. Did that really answer your question? Yeah, Not really. No, it does. It, it, it absolutely does. I, I was. Oh, sorry. Do I need that? Um, I was also thinking that um, there was also the partnership with with local businesses too, right? And and that was connected through technology, but then is an offline experience. Right. And I think that's really where I'm going at it. It's like, you know, these tech solutions, you can't go at it with, you know, you can't just drop off a program and be like, hey, here's your answer. And there has to be active hand-holding program management to like really make sure that it's sticking. And this program that I'm involved in um, is called NYC Today, uh, Together. Um, and it's based in North Brooklyn. And it's all about um, bringing communities um, cops and young people who have been arrested together. Um, so local businesses will um, host the young people as part of uh, internships. And we're working on um, a platform where local businesses and community members can uh, make a request on a map, say like this is a beautification spot that needs to happen. And then cops will work on these things with um, young people. So it's not really that tech is the sol solution, but it's part of the solution. So I have one question, and then I'd like to open it up for questions for everybody out here as well. Um, so a lot of what I'm hearing right now is about community norms um, and things that when you're in a community, you you know happens, you know what goes on. And we talked about this a little bit, uh, and I'll give a brief background in talking about um, the NYPD using uh, Facebook and other sort of pictures and ideas to trump up charges of conspiracy and gang-related crimes by saying, you know, you're in this picture together with this known offender, maybe you're involved in something here. Um, but coming from a community, it's 
it's it's normal. You, you grew up with these people, you go home, you take a picture, all of these ideas. Um, and a lot of what you're saying as well, from immigrant populations, mm -hmm. knowing that you're going to take care of your, your younger siblings or you're going to be spending time here as well as there. Um, how do we include community norms within technology is my question. <laughs> yeah. Um. <laughs> Right, the easy answer is like <laughs> ethnographic research. <laughs> yeah, that's a good answer. <laughs> right. Um, but it's so much easier to say that and just be done with it. Um, and it always comes back to like kind of like how do you fund someone to infiltrate a community, learn about them, you know, and then come up with an answer that is tailored to that community. And, and then how do you scale that? to other communities across the country or across the city even, right? Like one, like an app that's designed for um, Jamaica might not work for, um, you know, the Bronx. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> I just wanted to thank you because uh, from the outside looking in, it seems like there's, there's easy fixes for education or, or at least clear fixes. And, and it's the same with intervening with youth. And I think that, that Nick's work shows, shows the multiple layers that are necessary in order to intervene effectively. And, and he was part of a two-year ethnographic research, which meant working directly with these, these kids, interviewing them, finding out about their family life, finding out about the challenges that they were facing that kept them either in the system or prevented them from getting whatever help they needed um, to, to move, move away um, or progress. So, so um, as we're framing our questions, I'd just like you to keep that in mind, that, that this is a very challenging issue, and, and it's, a, it's, it's a really great opportunity to sort of talk about this intersection of poverty, vulnerability, education, and, and the civil rights issues. So we'd like to open it up for questions. Yeah, I hope nobody came actually looking for a concrete answer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we should have framed it as a rhetorical question. <laughs> yeah. Hello. Hey. Um, hi. Uh, I hope that's not coded a hello, um, and you're not reading into it. Um, so there's a, a, a few things uh, for the video. This is Noel Hidalgo. Um, so one, um, to answer that last question that you were dealing with, like how do you deal with designing an app that kind of works for the ecosystem. Uh, there are two really great examples that, um, one in Chicago and another one that's here, uh, they're essentially UX groups. Um, and uh, one is called Cut, and this is the uh, Citizens User Testing Group, and then Dig, which is Design, something or other, uh, 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 design innovation group. Um, and one is from Blue Ridge Labs under Robin Hood here in New York City, and then the Sh Smart Chicago Collaborative in uh, Chicago. Um, and in both cases, they uh, use small incentives uh, to get people, to get their users, to essentially give them user feedback. So uh, in both cases, they have discount cards or they have coupon cards or uh, uh, gift cards that they give to their their users and they go to the communities that they're looking to research or that they have apps to and then they essentially do the user testing and then they share that information with the general uh, uh, kind of like civic hacker or the IT community so that way that feedback that ethnography work in the IT world is socialized in a way that then people who are looking to build other applications for those different communities can uh, you know leverage uh, the, the community insights that have already been generated. And then what's cool is that if you've built your app uh, off of that research, they encourage the app developer to go back to those same people and to engage them to see how, how, how those apps work. So that, I think that's one thing that we haven't developed here in New York City that we could um, uh, investigate. And then, hold on, uh, hold this for a second. I have um, just a few more things here. <laughs> While you do that, I think, yeah. I think you have a great point about, like, I think Robin Hood and Blue Ridge is a great example of an effective community partnership where a nonprofit organization that has the funding and provides funding for a lot of different nonprofit organizations in the city also works with a tech lab to have, um, you know, it's about different strains coming together. Yeah. Which, which yeah. then goes to uh, two encouragements. Um, the one is to, if you've done all this ethnographic research yourself, can you share it in a way so that way communities like Beta NYC and other civic hacker communities like Civic Hall that happen to be down the street 
can utilize that research so that way we're not having to duplicate the same work that you've already invested in. Um, and then the, the second encouragement is to be thinking about the data that's underlying next move. If you go through and you pay for uh, uh, normalizing all of this data, there's a, an application or a protocol code open referral, which is uh, designed to be an interoperability of, uh, of referral data, um, which means that once you've improved this and somebody else, it's kind of like a Wikipedia for referral data, um, so other people can be improving that model and improving that data so that way other people can be using the data. And if you share it in an open way, right, the, the, the benefit of being open, somebody else who's looking to do and develop an application for children in Chinatown and are looking at the different demographics and looking at different languages can still use that same normalized data that you've gone through that whole process and they can just do, localize an app for, for Chinatown. So it's all about, in, in many ways, it's like embracing the openness um, and figuring out those points of collaboration. So that's how I answer that last question. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, I mean, definitely. Um, and that's kind of like one of the yeah, I mean, I think you know, community collaboration is really the answer, and it's also about you know, tech people going out and being really social and like embedding themselves in the communities. Um, I mean, this is you you talked about um, like normalizing the data and stuff like that. This doesn't even have like they're not peop, they're not even tracking um, conversion rates, right? Like that would be like a really great place to start, so that we can start optimizing this like website for the different populations, but. I think that's part of the challenges that you have is like when you have nonprofits um, coming together with tech organizations to produce um, produce a product that is um, that works for the organization. It might not necessarily work best for the population that we need to serve, and I think that's just going to come together with time. And as you know, evangelists like yourselves like go out and like talk to people and say like you know you really need to do this. You know, uh, I think it's just growing pains. mentioned tech going into the community, but what, what about the idea of long-term recruiting people who are in the community to do these things instead? Um, which, you know, like, wouldn't happen overnight, but... And that's why I was really lucky to work at the Center for Quarter Innovation, because we had access to all those young people, um, and they would... It was so easy to go out there and just go to them, have them come to us, um, but then it's again about incentives, and that was one of the biggest challenges that we faced in helping to design an app like this for disengaged youth and um, for another project that we we're working on for kids that have been arrested. It's, you know, these are kids that are um, like least likely to leave their, um, their neighborhoods if ever before, you know, like maybe they're mandated to a program in, uh, maybe they live in Brownsville and they had to go to Red Hook. Probably the first time they're ever going to leave Brownsville. Um, and incentivizing and making it easy for them to understand exactly why and how this is important work. Um, because I mean, it's even with like pizza and a movie ticket, it's like amazing how far people will travel for a metro card, a slice of pizza, and you know, a movie ticket. So I, I'm really curious about uh, when it comes to this sort of you know cradle to prison and. I guess I'm, I'm sort of interested in the data. That, that, I mean, you did a lot of really good ethnographic research, and I think you get these beautiful sort of narratives of the sort of struggle and how kids are trying to progress in society. But I'm also wondering how much data exists already. Um, is it you know accessible? And let's say you were to design, let's say, some kind of predictive model off of that, then would people even be receptive to those kinds of you know analyses and things like that? And so from that angle, I'm just wondering what it, what is it, what is it out there already? that you think, and would that even be useful in terms of what you're trying to do? We did try to find, uh, that there's, there's both. There's, there's, there's data that shows things like preschool intervention, right? And so that's why we're, uh, Obama recently um, announced uh, national preschool, right? Um, but there's, there's also data that's missing. Um, for example, um, when you say, cradle to prison. There's research that shows low, low socio socioeconomic status, but there's still, we don't know the levers, right? We don't know exactly, like, like if we intervene by age 8, if we intervene by age 13, what will the differences be? But there is actually quite a bit of data showing um, that 
if, if, you, if you're raised in a low socioeconomic status, and this is quantitative data, um, you know, the, the likelihood of going to college, the likelihood of, um, there, there's the um, statistics about um, how much income you'll earn, um, how long, you, you know, whether you're, you'll be married or divorced, those sort of statistics are, are available. But does that answer your? Yeah, I guess I'm also interested in the influence of that analysis, and so whether that's actually going to change minds and hearts. Um, part of it is at the end of the day, you can do an amazing analysis and show these amazing things, but if people who actually have the levers of power to shift and change policy don't do anything about it, there's also, I'm just curious what that culture exists and how, how that is right now. I'm going to pass You know, I actually think that that's where um, journalists are so important because you know how to tell the story, right? Researchers sort of find the data and we get really buried in the data and how to, how to find the data. Um, who to speak with, how to make it balanced and objective, but we need you to tell the story <coughs> often. And, and I, I would love if gra in graduate school we would get better training in, in, in telling the story because it's so important. And then what ends up happening often is that um, maybe studies that aren't as strong, you know, get promoted over over um, studies that are that um, are stronger. Uh, so I have a question about knowing whether what you're doing is effective. And it seems like the, the outcomes you ultimately care about are going to happen 10 years down the line, which completely breaks the tech model of, of fail fast. Um, so how do you approach knowing whether anything you did had any effect? Um, we really focus a lot on user stories. And I, that's just kind of like the best proxy, especially when you have these subpopulations that are very small and with very specific problems. Um, and that, to kind of go back to your question, it's like um, one of the big things that we asked these young people um, when we first started working with them to make an app is like, you know, what motivates you to get out and try to do something? Um, is it like Debbie Downer data that tells you how likely it is that you're going to fail if you don't do this one action? Um, like if you don't go to school today, what is the increase in probability that you know you're going to fail that class, for example? Or is it um, information that motivates you and inspires you to go out there and gives you a sense of hope for what you can change. And that story in terms of like, that's, that's really how we've been if, um, gauging effectiveness by um, how often we see um, and how often we see these, um, like in social media, how often we see um, young people sharing this app with um, you know, a story about like, you know, maybe like a little just caption being like, oh, I did this and I went. You know, or if a young person mentions an app like this at all, I think that's a big win. Um, I guess the standards are a lot different when you're looking at um, something like this. Right. Oh, this is jumping back a little bit, but I wanted to um, respond to the prior question as well as the other question that was raised and link it back to some of your work on participatory design or participatory collaborative design. And um, one of the things that I, I kind of reacted to in your um, question, comment, was that the influence needs to go upwards, right? That the influence ought to be on public policy, uh, policymakers, and you know, people in positions of power. But what I heard you say in your description of participatory design is that there's a lateral movement that actually needs to happen within the communities that are affected by the issues that you're trying to solve through technology. And so I'm wondering if you could talk just a little bit more about um, how you plan to kind of continue a participatory or collaborative design process that um, would enable the solutions that you're trying to develop have this kind of co-constitutive power within a community. I kind of go back to um, a couple um, examples of really successful participatory design. Um, I go back to Rosario in Argentina, um, where they have an entire city um, with multiple modes of access for participatory design. Um, Eight-year-olds, I think they give, um, the city gives um, a group of eight-year-olds like $64,000 where they come up with a public benefits project. Um, in Toronto, um, there's a Toronto housing, um, um, so, um, 
yeah, Toronto Public Housing has also gives um, housing residents money to do that. So I think it really comes back to just kind of like uh, getting support from the city. I mean, in, um, in Brooklyn, for example, you know, there's a lot of participatory budgeting processes that happen that, frankly, like, you know, even like I'm a, you know, participatory, participatory like, you know, civic nerd, um, but I didn't know that Jumani Williams or like city, different city council members had their own participatory budgeting processes in the city, you know? Um, and then, you know, going out there and like um, participating and getting to know both the population that you want to help and the population that feels, or, and the group of people that that population feels like is help um, holding them back the most, right? So like, for example, one of the things that um, people are always really excited to do when they're, um, when I've talked to people about like p police um, community relations and you know finding a tech solution that can bring young people and cops together is like let's go talk to the to kids and see what they want, but it's not also let's go talk to the cops and see what they want as well. But I just really wanted to thank you all for your insights and input. And please feel free to talk to us more. And I especially want to thank Nick. Um, you're doing extraordinary work, and it's really hard to talk about, right? Because everybody sort of feels that since they went to school, they understand education. And, and, and there's also this um, attitude that I think a lot of people believe kids deserve, you know, if they're in the correctional system, they might deserve it or something. And so, so you're dealing with kind of uh, quite a few assumptions. And, and so breaking those assumptions and doing, doing the difficult work, the, the work that, you know, might not, we might not see the results, as, as has been pointed out for, for years, is just really commendable. And did you have any last thoughts, or? Uh, no, I just, you were like way too generous. <laughs> um, <laughs> and yeah, I don't know, it's, it's an ongoing, I would love to hear everybody else's thoughts about um, how to solve this going forward, about better ways to listen and better ways to um, engage the community so that you can keep learning and keep generating ideas about the best ways to help the communities that you're embedded in. And I think we should thank Irene for putting us all together too. And <laughs>